Well, it's time for the study, though. It's time to get into the Word of God together. Uh, if you have not been here, we're about halfway through a seven-week series studying multiple letters that Jesus dictated himself to seven different churches during the time of John, when he was in kind of his retirement years, when he was exiled onto the island of Patmos about the end of days. And these are seven letters written to seven churches that existed during his time that were dealing with different issues, different things that God wanted to exalt them in, as well as take and speak into some of the concerns that he had that are issues that we still deal with today as a church and that we also still deal with today as Christians. So as we are going through a time as a church family, this TSF is changing mentality behind me, that over the summer we're really opening ourselves up to evaluate the community around us, how we're reaching the community, what the needs of the community are, as we're looking at what are the needs within the walls as well, and how are we doing discipleship-wise, relationship-wise, and offering that all up to God to just kind of show us our next steps, whether that be if the ministry needs shut down, or if a ministry needs tailored, or something we're doing uh, now just does, isn't relevant anymore, if there's something new that needs to happen. We're just kind of putting everything on the table and looking at some of these things. So this study series definitely falls into place with us as a church to look at these type of things that might be underlining, um, not because we have any kind of major issue within the church right now. Matter of fact, my favorite time to look at vision, my favorite time to evaluate things is when there is no major issue within the church. And uh, just being able to say, God, what do you think? What do you think? Um, from, from there also, these things are very much applicable to our lives as individuals as well. And we've already been hearing some really good testimonies. And I've been really encouraged about what the Spirit's doing in some lives within these areas. Uh, some of the things we talked about so far, we talked about the Church of Ephesus, the first week, which were a church that were doing great works and doing great things and really um, active within the community, but they had lost their passion. They had lost their love for God. Not that they hated Him, it just wasn't their motivation anymore. It wasn't really the, the underlining uh, mode or foundation that they had anymore. And so he reminded them, sometimes we get that way, where we're just kind of going through the motions and everything's pulled away our passion. And he says, don't forget to just stop and think what it used to be like when you first came to the Lord. Remember what it was like when you first realized you had grace and mercy just wash all over you and that you had now spiritual life and still spiritual death just because he loves you and you said yes. Just because you acknowledge him as God, he acknowledged Jesus as the Son of God, you believe in your heart, he died and rose again, you said, my life is yours, and you actually follow him, then just remember how that beauty was, and that that's still your passion today. Uh, from there, we also talked about the Church of Smyrna. The uh, Church of Smyrna was dealing with a lot of hardship, a lot of struggles. Some was uh, persecution because of their faith. Other challenges were going on in their lives as well. And uh, I don't know if there was anybody that's went through that study that says, oh, I don't understand that because I have no hardship whatsoever. You know, we all understand what it's like to live with hardship. And that we went through that, that study and really dug into the fact that Satan does have the power to, te to, to test us, to try to drag on us, to, to tempt us, but he does not have the authority to defeat us. That we have authority through Jesus Christ for victory. The only person that can really defeat Tom is Tom giving up. And so we kind of looked at that and that encouragement. Last week while I was on the road, uh, Ginger shared with you on the church of Pugnum, which was dealing with some false teaching in their church. And we've really dug into what it looks like when you don't address false teaching within the church, how to address false teaching, not just within the church, but in our own lives, when we're living things other than what the Scripture calls for us, and that we have to take things back to the Word. We have to live by the Word. If I teach anything on a Sunday morning, and you're not double-checking it in the Word to make sure that I'm not crazy, you're missing a step. It's a, the, you're not coming to hear Tom. You're coming to hear the Word. So make sure you always take it back to Scripture, and it matches up. If it doesn't, then you need to have a chapter with me or the elders or something because we got to get that fixed real quick. Everything's got to be taken back to the Lord. This week we're going to go to our fourth church, which has kind of a similar issue when it comes to false teaching, but it's going to reveal itself in a different way, in a way that I think does take down a lot of churches, puts a lot of people in church, and takes an awesome stumbles in our own life. So let's go ahead and get into the Bible and look at that one. So if you've got your Bibles with you, we're going to Revelation chapter 2. Believe it or not, we're only 18 verses into this chapter. After, even though we've covered three different churches so far. But uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 18, I think uh, most of some are familiar with how things work around here. There are all Bibles in the baskets underneath the chairs. If you do not have a Bible, feel free to use one of those or take that home with you if you need a Bible. Uh, and then also, you version is up and running for those who like to use the phones or the tablets where everything's already provided for you. But we're going to go to Revelation uh, chapter 2 to a church called Thyteria and look at what they were dealing with 
and what God has to say to them, or what Jesus has to say to them if, uh, within their context. So if you're there, let's go ahead and dig in with the first verse that says, To the angel of the church of Thyatira, write, The words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I'm sure I'm saying that burnished wrong. Burnished? Burnished? Somebody correct me. There we go. I'm going to say it wrong multiple times. So, same pattern as what we've had before. Who were the letters to? Who it's coming from? That we, we see oftentimes within the, this culture in this time. To the church criteria. Let's talk a little bit about who they were, just so we have the context of the original letter. This is uh, the smallest of the seven cities that we have the, that's being written to. It's the longest letter that we're going to have from Jesus, but it's the smallest city. Uh, it is actually, I, I believe, if my memory correct, about half the size of the next largest city uh, that's written to. Within this city, though, they have a lot of influence. They are famous for their material that they produce and that they put out. They're very famous for uh, textile type uh, exports, especially for a particular purple dye that they have that's exclusive to this city that was in high uh, demand within the, the culture at the time. On top of that, they had these incredibly uh, well done trade groups within their city for exporting and importing to the point that if the rest of the culture was kind of like today and they were doing have seminars of this is how you do trade, they would bring in these exports to come in and share with the other communities. So even though they were small, because <laughs> size of a, a church or size of a, of, of a ministry doesn't really have as much to say as some of the things Jesus is going to talk about. They were influential. They, they, they were doing, doing the work and they had their opportunity. Now, as we also see when we're talking about who it's from, we all know all of these letters are from Jesus, but each time he defines himself with different metaphors to say something about his character or his power or his heart to what that church is dealing with in this moment. And in this case, he defines himself three ways. One, he's the son of God, and that's the most blunt that he has said it in any of these letters. I'm the son of God. I am the one who has eyes that are just full of flame, flame like fire, and I'm the one with that one messed up word, bronze feet, okay? But here's where those three things really come into, because again, we've, this is kind of light symbolism of, of Revelation. It's pretty easy to figure out, but just kind of bring them all together. He wants to say at the beginning of the letter, I have the authority of God. The one who's speaking into this, I am speaking as the Son of God. And there is a lot of implications to that, including purity, including intimacy, including passion, including grace. But within this, he gives us these other two steps as well, that there is something that he has seen that he's lit about. There is something that he's seen within this church that has got his anger, his holy anger, ablazon that he has seen with those eyes. And not only is he the, the intimacy and the love and the salvation of the church, but he's also the judge of the church. And when there's something that's wrong within the church or within Christians, because we are the church, that is off, that we continue to embrace, and that we do not address if after a period of time, because one of the things I love about Jesus is he always gives us that season of patience and reaching out to us. But we're going to see that there's also a time when there's judgment. And he's got those feet of bronze ready to go. There's something going on that the Son of God says this is not right and we're really close to judgment and I need to talk to you, church, about it. I need you to realize how serious this is and I need you to let you know that this is the two paths in front of you and you get to choose which one you want to go. So with that set up, I would think the people in the, in the church of Thyteria are probably a little nervous, a little bit wondering what's going on, but he does the gracious thing he does in most of these letters, not all of these letters, but he starts out by telling them what he sees that's going on very well within the church. Look in verse 19. He says, look, I know your works, I know your love, I know your faith, I know your servant, uh, service, I know your patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. Now let me put all those up on the screen for you, because I want to kind of put those in our, our forefront and walk through what he's saying he's seen within this church, because what he sees within this church paints a very powerful, very awesome picture. <coughs> When he's starting out by saying, you know, I, I, I see your works, I see your deeds, I see your programs, I see the things that you're doing to reach the community, I see the things that you're doing, the effort that you're putting into being the church 
in the community that's around you. This is much like what we had in the church of Ephesus. You're doing good things. You've got the food pantry. You've got the nursing home ministry. You've got the prison ministry. You've got the clothing closet. You've got all these things going on that are ministering to the needs of people that are hurting, people that I love, people that I've put on your heart. You're doing the right things. I see that, and I'm thrilled about it. But unlike the church of Ephesus, not only are you doing the works, you have not lost that initial motivation of love. You are still loving. You still are doing it because you're passionate about people, and you love me, and you love others. And I see that foundation within your church as well. So they're already kind of a step ahead of Ephesus within that particular area that we're looking at. There you also see, I see that you are moving in faith, that you do things because you believe, not because you have the money right in front of you, not because all the, 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 the answers of A, B, C, and D are going to equal E, you, but, but you're willing to do what I call you to do because you believe in the promises, you, you're doing the right things. I love that about you. I see the service that you're doing. I see that you're doing it for ministry's sake and not for entertainment's sake. You're not trying to just make everybody feel good. You're not trying to take and make everybody on the same page so that more people show up. You're, you're doing the ministry. You're doing the word. You're leaning into these things and addressing these things. And you have endurance. Much like the church that we're talking about in the program. You're going through some tough times. There are some persecution because of Christ, uh, being Christians. You're doing it. You're staying there. You're continuing to do it. And with all these things going on, you guys every day are doing more than you did yesterday. You're doing more now than you were doing at your very first. You're growing. You're growing in your acts. You're growing in your influence. You're growing in how many people you bring into the Lord. I see this within your church. And if we look at this, I want to be part of that, right? If you're out looking for a new church family or those type of things, aren't these the type of things that we're looking for? Not, not, not hypocrisy, not just going through the motions, not tradition being more important than the Holy Spirit's movement. These are the type of things that we look for in the church. This is good news that Jesus is noticing this within them. But that doesn't mean everything's okay. And I'm actually, I've already asked Sarah, we're just going to leave this up the entire time because I, I want to acknowledge right now that this is the type of church we want to be. This is the type of church that we see that, that makes an influence and makes an impact, has many things to celebrate, but that doesn't mean that they're godly. Look at this next, next section with me. Verse 20. This is when they start shaking a little bit because he says the word but. Oh, what a powerful little word. But I have this against you. I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her that time to repent. I gave her that season of patience, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. The challenge with this church is they are allowing a false influence continue to influence the church family. Now, if you stop and think, this is the church that he's talking to. What in the world are these people doing letting a false prophetess come into the midst and not just take and lead them to idols, because eating the food of the idols, that's drawing close to idols. We're not supposed to have anything to do with idols. Nothing's more powerful than our God. She's leading them to idols, and she's leading them to sexual immorality. How does somebody like that get influence in this? You with me? I mean... We, we've gotten some really nice input from everybody so far. We haven't even kind of gotten to just within us. We're getting good input so far as how the community sees us and those type of things, and it's all good. But tell me, would you stay here if we had someone who's calling himself a priestess that was telling you to eat food and sacrifice to idols and to have sexual immorality with one another? That's like Waco, Texas stuff, you know? I mean, that's cult stuff. Some of us are watching like these TV shows of the extreme faith stuff. I don't know. I probably remember who I was talking to was watching that with me. That, that's, that's out there. How is she having influence in this? And I'm going to suggest that there's probably two ways that that might have happened. Jesus does not reveal it to us here, but I'm going to suggest to you that my, my guesses are educated guesses, and I think as I describe them, you're going to think, yeah, I could see that. The first one has to do with being inclusive. If we look even at the church today, there are a lot of times that we bring things into our community, into our ministry, 
trying to attract more people that do not yet know the Lord that sometimes are in complete contrast to the scripture, but we justify it away. This woman, from we know from a history standpoint, had a lot of influence within this community that they had a lot of possibilities within. They were excited about what's going on. Matter of fact, the third thing that she was doing that we know from history that Jesus didn't even get to here was she was also very popular when it came to fortune telling, which the scripture warns us against as well. She had a lot of influence. So she comes into the church and says, hey, I'd like to partner with this. I'd like to see, I like what you guys are doing. I like what you guys have going on in the community. Can we bring these things together? As shocking as it may seem, not being presented the way that Jesus has, there might be those who take and say, let's bring these two things together and then we can minister to her as she's in our midst and fix it as we go. It's kind of like a young man or a young woman not really liking a lot of things about their fiancé, but I can fix them after we get married. And we all know how well that goes. Right? Fix that during dating. Don't fix that during marriage. It doesn't quite work that way. And so as she comes in, and as more people are coming in, and they're getting more excited about the things that are going, and they're putting a flowery picture in front of it, you get a lot of excitement for people in the church that they're continuing to grow. The things that they were drawn to that church for within that city are continuing to grow. Then we sometimes get to a point that we've got so watered down that we're not overlooking the sin, we don't even notice it anymore. That is one way that she very easily could have made quite a bit of influence within this church. A lot of times, this is why we have to be in the Word so much. We as Christians, living in this world, even though we're not of it, can justify things so easily because we are born into sin. Have you ever had that moment where you're like, okay with something, okay with something, okay with something, read a little bit in Psalms, and all of a sudden you go, ah, God, you're right. I shouldn't be doing that. You ever had that moment? That's why we got to be in the Word. This is when Jesus steps into it and says, look, let me tell you what I see through my eyes of flame. This is not okay in my church. There were people reading this going, I didn't even see it anymore. I didn't realize that it had gotten that bad. I know there's the seasons of my, my family, my family growing up. The church I grew up in had, had some struggles now, y'all. And there was a season I remember there was a guy who was pastor at our church. He was not a pastor, but he could speak well. And we were in need of a pastor, so they asked him if he would become the pastor. Uh, the very man who baptized me in the pond, uh, that after my decision to come to the Lord, was also someone who was having two affairs within the church that were known within the church, and he still was not asked to leave for another year. We justify things in some messed up ways. And sometimes we need Jesus to step in and say, it's not okay. We cannot water down the word to reach people. The second one is in the name of the woman. There is, and if you've not really been through this, and it's okay, but there, there is a, a demonic force, a demonic attack, however you want to look at it, uh, that, that we call the Jezebel spirit. And I don't have uh, the, me- the time to really get deep into what the Jezebel spirit is or how it manifests itself uh, today. But as I do kind of a summary of this particular situation, because I consider this the granddaddy of all demonic attacks, um, if it sounds familiar, if it sounds like maybe you have dealt with it in the past or dealing with it now, if you go to our, our church page, tsflife.com, or if you go to our YouTube channel, or, uh, if you're on Right Now Media, you can go to the Shepherd's Fellowship page. About 10 or 11 months ago, I did a study here on the Jezebel spirit that was much more in-depth. Um, if something sounds familiar, I encourage you to go check out that podcast. Uh, we have video and audio available. And then if it still seems like something that you're dealing with, will you do me a favor and touch base with me because you need help? It is a nasty, evil, demonic force. Here's basically how, how it works, and I'll use... It could, it could take force in your, your family or your job, whatever the case would be, but I'm going to talk about from a church context because that's what we're dealing with here in the Scripture. If we see the Jezebel spirit move within the church, this is how it usually works. Usually someone comes into the church, can be a man, can be a woman, and when you meet them, they're one of the most engaging, charismatic people you have ever met in your life. There's just something about them that draws you to them. And you're going to find that they are great listeners. That if you've got something that's going on, they're really empathetic, they want to hear, they want to invest into you, they're praying for you, and they will be like spiritual giants. 
they would be like the brother or sister in Christ mentor that you have always been looking for so that you are drawn closer and closer in to a relationship with them. All those things sound great. That's what we're looking for when it comes to people within the body of Christ, but it then continues to go further. Usually after about a year, year and a half, you'll start noticing things don't seem exactly right anymore. You start noticing that there's more gossip, maybe kind of almost borderline backstabbing, uh, and usually, and again, keep it in the church context, it's about the pastor or the elders or somebody else that's in leadership with the, in, in the church. That there's something without the, this demon, that what it's trying to do is get in the door to get a stronghold and then emasculate leadership because they want to be in control. This demon wants to take control within the church and cause pain and heartache. It will seem confusing because this is the same person that has been my rock for the last year, year and a half. And you're still trying to justify it a little bit. Or maybe they're just going through a bad time, a bad season. And at some point, you might even get to the point just to say, hey, is everything okay? Because th- this doesn't seem right. Maybe we need to go talk to the pastor. Maybe we need to go talk to the elders together. And you'll hear responses like this. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I was just blowing off steam. I, I didn't mean anything about it. I was just blowing off steam. And just and back off. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. It's just a bad moment. Forgive me. And because what they're doing is they're testing to see how far they can go with you. And then they want to retreat from any kind of accountability that comes with it. And it will continue to grow. And it will continue to impact more people. And it will start getting more and more ugly. And it will start getting more and more boisterous. And taking into rationalizing who that person is versus who you thought they were becomes more and more painful to the point you're kind of sucked in. And what, what the whole purpose of, from a demonic standpoint, from a spiritual warfare standpoint, is that demon is basically setting you up to be a human shield so that when somebody else sees it plainly and saying, hey, this isn't okay, that you're staying in the middle going, no, wait, if you just understood them, if you just understood where they're coming from, they're, they're really sweet, they're really loving, they were there for me when my mom passed away, they were there for me when I went through my struggles. They're incredible people. That's completely set up so that the demonic force has as much time as possible to cause as much pain as possible. And one thing that you're going to find any single time you see an attack from the Jezebel spirit is it's going to be in some way, shape, or form sexual. The one thing we see within the Jezebel spirit over and over and over and over and over again, anything from flirtation to actual intercourse is used to gain influence over other people to be those human shields. You still with me? It's ugly. It's ugly, y'all. And I'm telling you, for us being here for 14 years, we, uh, we don't deal with it like every month. I'm talking about something that usually comes up about once. For us, our weird pattern seems to be about once every three or four years we see this happen and we have to address it. First time it came in, it really rocked us because it is so extreme, it's outside of your and my normal mentality of what to be looking for or to expect. It's kind of like if you were hanging out with a serial killer and it comes out, you're like, I never saw that until afterwards. Okay, now I see this, I see this and this because you don't think like a serial killer. You don't see it, right? It's at that extreme. And it did cause a lot of struggle, not just within our church, but within our leadership team. Because of the way we were trying to gauge it, trying to figure out what it was. The second time we went through it, we had a little bit better understanding. We got better resources within it, and it was still hard. The third time and the fourth time, we saw it quicker, we dealt with it quicker, and there was less pain. But there's still pain. Because the people that are working under the influence of the Jezebel spirit are not demons themselves. They're people that we love. And with the Jezebel spirit is a strong spirit that oftentimes brings division that you continue to pray for reunification on. This here is not the person that that spirit is named after. She, and you can see this in that sermon that I talked about earlier again, I think it was 11 months ago, uh, and it's simply called the Jezebel spirit. It's not that hard to find. Um, It's named after someone that's in the Old Testament that um, Elijah went up against. And Elijah had just gone up, if you remember, against the king of the kingdom. He just went up against 400 prophets of Baal with a massive warfare. He didn't even break a sweat. And as soon as the woman Jezebel says she was uh, going to kill him, he freaked out and said, God, just kill me. Because that's how overwhelming this is. There's no coincidence that she's named this. She has come in and has implanted herself within this church with that influence, with those supporters, with those who have gotten so far into it that according to Jesus here, they are following her into immorality and they are following her into idol worship. And they haven't dealt with it. 
It's hard to deal with. It's a struggle to deal with. But it still is in submission to Jesus Christ. And Jesus said it's not okay. It's not okay. So that's another way that she very easily could come in to this situation. Even though the church looks like this from the outside. The church is not dealing with it. And when they do not deal with it, Jesus eventually does. Verse 22. He says, Behold, I will throw her, Jezebel, onto a sickbed. Those who commit adultery with her, I would throw into great tribulation, lest they repent of her works. And I will strike her children dead. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. Harsh words. Let's talk about them. I do believe Jesus is speaking very plainly into that situation. I guarantee you that Jezebel ended up into a serious sickbed situation. Those who were in cahoots with her were thrown into great tribulation uh, if they did not repent of their works. And I do believe that her children were struck dead. How does that play out in our church today? Our lives today? We all know the phrase, you made your bed, now lay in it. That's basically what I see he's talking about here. She has set herself into a position for her own gain that's going to turn against her that she will be laying in that sickbed. That those things will not be working out. Those who are in cahoots with her, those who are around this, those who are drawn into it, when she falls, they're going to be confused, they're going to be overwhelmed, it's going to really rock their world. And then as far as the works that she put into place, those things that she bore of those efforts and of that heart and of that demonic force will be destroyed. They will not survive. Jesus will. His things stand on a firm foundation forever. But her glee right now is going to be her downfall. And we see these things in churches and in our lives all the time, even today. Over the years as, as a pastor, there's a lot of different um, seminars and trainings that I go to across the country because I'm a big believer in continued education. You guys do not want a pastor who's the same pastor today as he was 10 years ago. You want somebody that's continuing to grow, right? And so that's part of that effort is to, to, to move to these things. And sometimes they're small, intimate events. Sometimes they're bigger events. Uh, there, there's a, a conference that several of us, I know Scott's gone with me, and Scott and uh, some, some others have gone to uh, what is called Catalyst, which is uh, down in Atlanta, Georgia. It's like 13, 14, 15,000 pastors uh, listening to some of the, the leading speakers of our day. And over the years, especially over the early years, I remember oftentimes I would hear people like, oh, I'm so jealous you get a go. Uh, because you get to go listen to the most uh, you know, powerful preachers in, in our country. And I would always respond, no, no, I don't. Only because what I'm aware of is probably the most powerful preachers in our country, some of the leading pastors in our church, probably are sitting in the audience and I'll never know their name. I just, I just know that's how God works. You know, some of the most powerful preachers that are doing the most powerful work in our country probably don't have enough money to go to Atlanta and sit and listen to a bunch of people for three days. Um, but they are the guys that get the stage. I just don't, I want to be a little cautious of who we put on our spiritual platforms, you know. And uh, over the, that time, there's probably been about 30 lady and, and man uh, speakers that, that, that travel in their circles. And I can tell you, oftentimes they have a, a massive church. Massive church. Uh, I remember one speaker uh, speaking, he says, Hey, let me give you an example. Let's say that you've got a small church. Let's say you only have like 500 people. And I'm like, dude, you're out of touch. <laughs> I love you, but you're like 20,000 person church has put you a little bit out of touch. Considering you know, over 90% of the churches in, in the United States are 100 or less, you're, you're, you're kind of hitting the wrong audience there. But nonetheless, most of them are mega church pastors, and they tell you no matter what church size you have, this is what God's doing, but yet everybody on stage is 5,000 or more people. So anyways... Within that, if I look at this, all of them have church ministries that nail this. All of them have more and more people coming and they're growing because of their works, their love, their faith, their servants, and their endurance. And I can tell you in those 14 years, off the top of my head, six that no longer have their churches. One for very good reasons. Because he's following the Lord, it's a different type of ministry that he was called into, and he, he's moved on, he's doing incredible work. So five left. Another one, I don't really blame. He was a pastoral burnout. 
he got to the point he just couldn't do it anymore. He wasn't a good leader because he was blown out. And I understand no matter what size church that you are, the challenges are somewhat unique to pastoring, the loneliness, the, the, the feeling like everybody's depending on you, the, the feeling you always have a certain look or perspective if you're in that type of church. Because you guys know I can be an idiot and goofball. You guys know, I'm, know, me, know me. I don't have to do at least that part of it. But the, in a lot of churches, you have to be perfect all the time. And it got too much. And so he's now doing another type of ministry. Great. These four were because sin came into the house. <coughs> These four were because when that loneliness came in, one decided that alcohol was going to be how they would meet the need of that hurt and that pain that was inside them. That alcohol led to emotional abuse of his spouse and his children to the point that he lost his church. For another, it was the authority that God gave him spiritually as a pastor that turned into ego and turned into being demanding and overwhelming to the staff and the volunteers of the church family, and there was no longer love. That there was unethical practices using the finances of the church ministry to take and boost his own book sales of his new book to make sure he was in the top ten within the, the country using unethical practices. It was a man who had a secret affair come forward of over 14 years of a woman who would stay in his home with him when his wife was out of town and oftentimes they were doing pastoral counseling one on one in his home when nobody else was there God won't let that continue God will take that out he will have a season of patience where he is reaching out to the people to try to bring them into repentance with him but if you refuse, there was a point where those hoofs came down and that fire was flamed up in the eyes and say, no more. And there will be people that are affected and confused and hurt by this. And the sad part is, a lot of times, especially if it's in the church environment, the church leadership environment, that will say, God, did God let this happen? I will never give church another chance. And that's exactly what Satan wanted when Satan was the one behind it, not God. And the works of that person will be thrown into the fire. Even the good works that they did will no longer be trusted. Because God wants better for them in the long run. And because the rest of the church has to know it's not okay to be this and have sin behind the scenes. It's also a warning for us. Now, this is not just within the church. This is also within our lives. I'll share with you a common testimony. Most of you probably have heard it. But it's the one for my own life that falls into this the most. I'll do a short version of it, and if you want the longer, grab my arm sometime. I'm more happy to tell you about it. When I was in my late teens, early 20s, I had moved out of my small little country home where I was pretty protected into the work world, and I was not really ready for it. I loved the Lord. I followed the Lord. I was taking people to church. I wanted to go into youth ministry at that time, but over a period of a year and a half, I went from thinking that taking $20 out of a cash register drawer was unthinkable to, oh, that makes sense. With the people that were around me and the jobs that I was at, and I'm talking three companies in a row, that was called scamming, not stealing. And it was justified by thinking, I deserve to be paid more than what they're paying me. It was justified that that did not go through the register, so they'll never know, so I'm not really hurting anybody. And there's faulty thinking that comes into our mind, like Jezebel, because we think she's not just the granddaddy of the, because she's the baddest, it's because she represents all sin. It always comes in with a hug, and it always leads to bondage. And that's exactly what ha happened with me when it came to taking 50 bucks here, 20 bucks there. And then you, most of you guys know the story. I'm working at a place, and for the entire time, there's times that God's taking part of my heart, don't do this anymore. There's times other people said things to me that they didn't know what I was doing, but I knew what God was trying to say to them. There was times I did better. There was times I didn't do it at all. There was times I go back to it. And that final night, when I took $50 out of that cash register drawer, I felt the words impressed on my heart, if you do this again, I'll lay you out. And I did it. And I'm telling you, if you ever hear those words on your heart, be smarter than me. That was the night they caught it. That was the night I was arrested. That's the night I lost my job. I lost my girlfriend. I lost my friends. I lost my reputation within the community. It was a small town. Everybody knew about it. Most of them saw me being led in handcuffs to the police car. Spent the night in the prison. Lost my apartment. Lost, my, lost everything completely laid out. And can I tell you, it's the most loving thing that God has ever done for me. Because he loves me too much to let me stay in that place. And if I would not listen, he like, for me, like with Saul on that road to Damascus, 
He laid him out to get him to look up, and that's what he did to me because he wants me back free. And some of us are in that boat. He did it publicly because everyone who thought that I was the good Christian guy, inviting them to church, taking them to church, and wanting to go into youth ministry, that God's not okay with hypocrisy. And when my mom said to me, and I've shared this with the best advice I ever got was from my mom right after this, when I felt completely ashamed and broken and I had nothing and said, everybody's seen as what I have done. And my mom said what? Do you guys remember? They saw what you did, but now they're watching to see what you do. Now it's time to build a testimony. He did it public so that my life can be a testimony. It has been over 30 years and there's still a couple of people in this world that will not speak to me. But I can also tell you many stories of what God has done with what he's done through faithfulness once I got out of the way. We can look like this. Sin is not okay behind the scenes. He'll take it out. Take it as a warning today. He will take it out. One of the things I love about this in two different places, he talks about repentance. Repentance. The thing I love about this is it's not like I'm lit and I'm just going to take everybody out to fire. But two different times, in verse 21 and then verse 20, 22, we see, unless they repent of their works. If there's anything in our lives, that anything in sin, if I had said to God when he said, if you do this again, I'll take it out, you're right, I'm done. And broke it to him, there would have been repentance, there was a new start. You have that same opportunity today, and we also do as a church as we look at things and continue to move forward. So I ask you, if you took a minute, what's your Jezebel today? If you're just really honest between you and the Spirit, what is your sin that maybe you're either just floating with or maybe you're full on in bed with? What is the thing that, that as you're sitting here today thinking about this from Jesus' standpoint, that you, you realize it's just not okay anymore? that it's growing and it seems to be getting worse. I'm on porn websites more. I, I continue to cheat on my taxes because I want to get an extra thousand dollars back. I've been flirting with somebody that's not my spouse because they get me. What are the things that right now is Satan been moving in, coming in as a hug, coming in as a shortcut, coming in as an easy answer that is leading you on a road to destruction? And just repent of it and just call it out. Listen, as you came in, and if some of you guys have been around long enough, you kind of have a gist of where I'm heading. But if you came in and you, and you were just kind of weirded out, we gave you all a tile. You guys all see that? Grab your tile. There's a reason for the tile. Most of you got Sharpies. We're not, the, we're not a rich church, so most of you got Sharpies, not all y'all. And there's a reason for it. Can I ask you just to do this for me? There's, there's two steps to it. The first one I'm going to ask everybody to do. The second one is between you and the, and the Lord. But can you identify, at the spiritual speaking to your heart, one, maybe two or three things? Usually if it's more than three things, there's a, a root problem that you've got, that you're dealing with. Can you identify something that's a Jezebel in, in your life right now? And just call it out and write it down on that tile. Just, just take a moment. Just capture it. You don't have to show anybody else. I guarantee you nobody else is ever going to see this. Um, if, you, if you're worried about the person next to you, turn it upside down. If that person's your spouse, then you guys need to work on your communication anyways. But, but take a moment, just call it out, capture it. Because one of the things that we're really good at doing as Christians, I'm looking at you all and half of you guys aren't doing it. I'm stopping now, I'm looking at you. Get your tile, write it down. I love you. I love you. This is the only time I'm going to pretend like there's some kind of like spiritual authoritativeness. From the high mountain of God, God has told me to tell you, take your tile, write it down. Thank you. You guys are doing better. I think, I think we're at 80% now. But um, I, I think we as Christians are really good at coming close to God, saying something really powerful to our lives and us getting it, and then we brush it off because it's uncomfortable and move on. That's why we're just capturing it now. And I'm just going to be patient with this. I'm going to give a couple seconds. Does anybody not have a tile? If you don't have a tile, Jenny's got some. Okay. And if you don't have a Sharpie, have a, someone around you that does. This is a community building experience. Just ask them for the Sharpie. They'll give you the Sharpie. We all need generosity in the house. Okay. 
keep writing that down, keep sharing those around. Because there's a reason that we want to really call this out is because there's some incredible promises in this next section of what Christ has for those who overcome. For those who will call it out, those who would destroy it out and lean into him, there's some incredible promises here. I think this is one of the reasons, one of the two main reasons why he identified himself as the Son of God. As you write, I'll just read it over you. But make sure you read it and get home. Make sure I'm not lying to you. Verse 24. But to the rest of you in Thyteria, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, as when earthly pots are broken in pieces, even as my, I myself have received authority from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Here's when things go bad in the community for those who are not involved in what Jezebel's doing. It's when we see it and we do not address it because we're afraid that this is going to get damaged. The person who's doing it, the person that's involved is someone that we love very much and we do not want to hurt our friendship with them and we do not want this to stop. This will be undercut every time that sin is not addressed. And it, I'll tell you what, we're not one of those cults that they can say if somebody walks away from the faith, you're not allowed to ever speak to him again. Shunning is unbiblical. But I will say this, if you're following the Lord and you've got a close friendship with somebody that has an issue in this area, it might damage your friendship. And that's painful, and that's not shunning. It's something we start praying about immediately, looking for reconciliation. But it's not okay to put a friendship over what God has with his purity. And in this case, he's saying, look, if you're not involved in that, you're not being sucked into this, I'm not going to put anything additional on you because there's already enough hurt and pain going on. There's already enough struggle going on with this. But keep doing what you've been doing. And trust me and continue to build that wall while you defend the gospel as well. Be able to do both. Defend and build at the same time. Do not stop. And here's what's going to happen. Why it might seem that other things that are of the world, verse 27, are breaking apart around you. There is an authority that my Father gives to me. So what Jesus says. And Jesus says, you know what I do with that authority? Is I roll it on to you. And you have the authority of God in your life that will not be defeated by the broken pieces of this world. You have authority over the broken pieces in this world, in your world, in your day-to-day life. You have authority through God if you hold on to what he's doing and don't give up. Don't water down. Don't try to hide and step into the gap. He says, you rule with, a, with an iron, iron rod. For those who have been watching some of these weird uh, faith and religion things with me on, on TV. There's one called a couple weeks ago there. They think that this rod of iron is an AK-47 and they're a big military. Let's uh, get guns because we're going to have to shoot everybody when the Armageddon comes. Uh, that's not what he's speaking about here. It's the authority of our God. It's his royal scepter. And if you really want to be honest about it, it's the iron still that put him on the cross that gave him the victory over death and over sin that gives you your authority today. Let him who has an ear hear what Jesus is saying to you today. Let the world be broken. Let the world be broken and live by him. This is the message of the church of Iteria.